Today on Applied Science, I'm going to talk about how I designed and built this spin coder. So I'll uh, describe everything I learned about low-cost motor controllers and make all the code and circuitry available in case you have a similar motor-based project. So let's see this thing in action. Uh, it's got a rotor here, and I've put flathead brass screws in here so that when I slip a microscope slide in and put one more screw in, uh, it holds it down and keeps it from moving on the rotor. So I'll press the green button, and uh, it spins at about 400 RPM indefinitely. And the idea is that you want to put a liquid onto the spinning slide, and uh, the spinning motion of the spin coater will fling the liquid out and make a very even coating on the slide. So I'm going to use this liquid, which is a photoresist, and I realize I'm doing this under shop lighting, so it's not going to be really useful, but this will just give you the idea. And then we press the green button again, and the machine uh, goes through a very controlled acceleration up to about 3,000 RPM. And when it reaches 3,000, it holds the speed, and it's counting up in seconds. So the whole idea here is that we want this process to be very repeatable, because we want a very consistent, even layer of photoresist. I had a different spin coder previously that didn't work nearly as well, so this is a really nice upgrade. You'll see we're getting up to about 30 seconds, 32, uh, the machine has a really rapid deceleration, and then uh, you can see that the slide is now nice and coated with this green photoresist. So here's a slide I coated earlier, and you can see that after it sits out under the fluorescent lighting, this one is nice and green, this one is nice and blue because it's been exposed by the fluorescent lighting in the shop. So let's take this thing apart, and you can see how it's built. This splash guard just lifts out. It's actually just uh, sitting in here, captive side to side with these uh, plastic blocks here, but it really just lifts out. And the reason it has this internal lip here is so that when the thing flings excess liquid out, it will fall down into this moat instead of making a mess on the table. So as you can see here, this is using a, uh, a motor designed for like a quadcopter or something like that. And uh, the reason for that is that the market for these motor controllers and um, motors for quadcopters is really developed. So you can get these for very cheap. So I bought a couple just because, I mean, this is like 15 or $10 or something like that. And the controller for it is similarly about 10 or 15 bucks. It's so cheap that um, even single chips from DigiKey that would do uh, a similar thing cost almost as much as the entire board. So let's open this up and we can see what's in here. Okay, so here's the insides of the box. And uh, this project was definitely a case of using whatever I had available on the shelf. So a lot of these things uh, I already had. In fact, the only thing that I actually bought for this project was the motor and the controller itself. But anyway, let's take a look at this. So we've got switched mains coming in here. Uh, coming down to this switch mode power supply, it's about uh, seven and a half or eight volts. Kind of weird, but that's actually the voltage that I needed, and I just happen to have this laying around. Uh, then we have an old-fashioned uh, parallel interface LCD up here, uh, the motor controller, and an Arduino micro that runs the whole show. So those two buttons are just connected right up to the Arduino micro, and we're using its internal pull-up resistors to uh, sense the state of those buttons. Um, a nice little tip, if you're using a ABS project box like this and you want to mount a circuit board or a heavy thing like this, what you can do is cut some chunks of thick ABS plastic, this is maybe 3 eighths of an inch thick, and drill a hole and tap it in this chunk. And then what you can do is attach the chunk with a screw to your circuit board kind of like that, thread that in there so that there's a plastic foot here, and then just drop the whole thing into your plastic enclosure, and then add some solvent weld. I ran out of thickened uh, solvent weld, but you can use this on ABS. You can also just use um, sewer pipe cement from the hardware store. It works great, very strong. Like that foot, the, the project box itself will break before that foot comes off. So if you need to fix something like a heavy power supply board, this works just fine. It also gives you the ability to just kind of move it around inside the project box before you commit to it. Okay, so let's talk about motor selection for a second. Um, when I started this project, I didn't know that I was going to be using one of these uh, quadcopter motors. I thought, oh, you know, maybe a stepper motor would be okay. 
Um, this project is not particularly well suited for a stepper motor because the speeds are kind of high. So you saw it was running at 3000 RPM, but potentially we'd want it to go up to four or even 5000 RPM, and that's really pushing it for a stepper motor. In addition, the steppers don't really turn particularly smoothly, and since there's no feedback, you kind of have to add a tachometer or a, um, a spin sensor to make sure that you aren't missing steps. Um, I realize that the rotor on this thing is not particularly heavy, so with sort of a known acceleration profile, it's unlikely that you'd miss steps, but even still, you'd probably want some feedback. So I decided not to use a stepper motor, um, and then that leaves, uh, you know, you could just use a plain old DC motor. In fact, in my previous spin coder, this was the older model, I just used this old cheap DC motor I got of an old cassette deck or something like that. And I had that same aluminum rotor pressed onto the shaft here, and this thing sat down in here like this, and I had a little bit more of a... Um, <laughs> this thing was a little bit taller, I cut this off to make the, the new shield. But anyway, the um, it, it's not quite enough power. It would be nicer if it accelerated and decelerated with more uh, control. So that was out. Another good idea is to use a hard drive. So when thinking about stuff that already exists in the world that kind of does what we want, a hard drive is actually pretty close. So this will get up to, you know, 7,000 RPM, no problem. It's even got this nice bearing system so that the thing spins smoothly. And it even already has like a disc shape on the front. And uh, the motor is built into this nice aluminum housing. So we can kind of, you know, bolt this down and it'd be great. And in fact, if you go on eBay, there's a company selling uh, low cost spin coders made out of hard drive motors. Um, and when I say low cost, I mean like 500 to $1,000 compared to what the semiconductor industry charges for these things, which is you know probably tens of thousands. Um, there's another nice feature about these. These often have a, a solid spindle. So this particular one doesn't, but on some hard drive models, the center of the spindle actually doesn't spin because it goes all the way through the motor to the bottom. And the cool thing about that is if you attach a vacuum hose to the bottom, you can put a rubber o-ring on the top and then when you put your glass uh, microscope slide down on that, you can use vacuum to hold the microscope slide down and that's, it gives you this nice convenient vacuum chuck. So I liked that idea, um, however, these motors still don't have quite enough power. So, you know, your 7200 RPM hard drive may take you know, five or ten seconds to come up to speed, and that's actually about right. But when I started this project, I thought I needed to have much faster acceleration to get, have a good spin coder. And uh, in a minute, I'll show you this thing connected up with the debug port. And it's actually pretty impressive how quickly this thing can change speeds. Another slight problem with using a hard drive motor is that this is a four-wire brushless DC motor. And it's wired up in what's called a Y configuration. So the four wires are one, two, three, and four. And obviously it's called a Y because it looks like that. But most of the um, brushless DC motors that are built for quadcopters and similar things are three wire and it's called a delta configuration because it looks like a Greek delta. And so the one, two, three wires there, and these are not really interchangeable. You can sort of get away with it a little bit, uh, but generally not really. And also the uh, coil resistances for these are generally not quite the same as they are for uh, quadcopter motors. So it is, and then you know later on you'll find out that the, the controllers that they make for these things are so cheap that it's just silly not to use them. So I decided not to go with the hard drive motor. If you go to a site like Hobby King or one of the places that sells a whole bunch of stuff for making your own quadcopters, you'll find the prices on these things are just really low. I mean this was probably $10 or something. I think they even have small motor controllers that are even under $10. And it's kind of silly because if you go to DigiKey and just look up the parts, like if you just buy uh, all the FETs to make this, or even a, you know, a, a monolithic chip that's got all the FETs in there, even that's going to get close to $10 just in parts. And so it's kind of silly to not buy this since it already has the firmware, it already has the controller, the capacity, I mean everything. And then the motor itself is um, 10 to $20, and it's known to work with it, so you kind of are guaranteed a working system just with these two parts. If you wanted to take a simple approach, you could just use these parts as they are, and these motor controllers are designed to be uh, controlled by this you know, servo standard, so it's three wires, uh, ground, power, and the servo signal, and the servo signal is just a pulse width that varies from 
uh, I think half a millisecond up to one and a half milliseconds, and that sort of indicates the throttle range. So you could totally connect this right up to your microcontroller, and people have already written um, servo libraries, so you can just tell it how much in percentage you want, and this thing will everything will work just fine. So there's almost no tweaking to do, although I, I wanted a couple uh, extra bits of functionality. One of them is that I wanted this thing to slow down on command. So since this is built for a quadcopter, there really isn't any need to break the motor. So if you, you know, lower the throttle, just the air resistance of the propeller that this thing would normally be connected to will slow it down. Uh, but you can actually configure these things to be uh, engine braking, I mean, or, uh, regenerative braking, and even just um, full braking. And luckily enough, the community is really well developed around these things. In fact, I don't know of any other product that actually lists a hex file on the package. It says afroenfet.hex. And at first I was thinking, you know, what? why would they just put the name of a hex file on a package? I mean, what does that even mean? And then you realize that you're entering this entire, like, huge community that's very, very well developed where, you know, there's a lot of jargon going on and it takes hours just to figure out what's going on. But basically... Um, the hardware has become very standardized and lots of folks have written their own firmware and uh, modding it is super common and it's actually very well documented it just takes a while to get going so take a look at the description of this video and i'll put links that will save you a lot of time if you're interested in modifying the firmware for one of these uh, you know for better or worse it is written in assembly uh, although again it is fairly well documented um, Another interesting bit is that some of these are made to be programmable over uh, the servo wire. So with just three connections, you in theory can send a bit stream over the control wire if you give it the right sequence. And someone even wrote a Chrome extension such that you can flash your firmware through Chrome uh, just with this one connection going to, I think they sell like a little USB programmer. So I tried it using an Arduino as the programmer. You can also connect this to an Arduino and use that as the programmer, but it didn't work. In fact, it actually ruined my device, and luckily I was able to recover it, but it did actually stop it from working. So I can't endorse that route, but luckily what I did is just, on this particular board, they've actually broken out the in-circuit programming port, and so these yellow wires here are going to a programming header, and again, I, I just used an Arduino as my programmer, um, compiled the assembly, uh, downloaded the firmware to this thing, and everything worked great. So I'll, I'll put details to that in the description. So here are the mods that I made to this thing in the assembly firmware. One is that instead of controlling it over this, you know, servo half millisecond timing pulse, you can actually configure this thing to accept I squared C commands. This is pretty cool since you could actually potentially have, you know, five or ten of these motor controllers in a project and control them, all of them, over the I squared C bus from your uh, microcontroller, whatever you've got. So that's cool. And then also, instead of just, you know, relying on the timing accuracy of microseconds to get the signal you want, if you're actually giving it the value you want over I squared C, you can be much more accurate and much more reproducible. So that's good. And then also, I wanted this thing to slow down if I gave it a slower speed than where the motor was currently spinning. Like I said, for most uh, quadcopter applications, it, it, you know, engine braking doesn't really make any sense because as soon as you lower the throttle, it'll slow down. But for RC car applications, uh, sometimes you want regenerative braking. So that's a switch in the uh, code that's relatively easy to flip. Also, if you give this thing the command of zero speed, it can do a much more uh, aggressive braking thing. So instead of regenerative braking all the way down to zero, if you give this a zero, it will actually you know, essentially short out the motor windings in the controller so that it will decelerate as quickly as possible. The difference is that when it's regenerative braking, it's still commutating so that the thing knows where the motor is, where the rotor is, and then you can speed back up quickly if you want. If you give it the command of zero, that will actually stop commutation, so it no longer knows where the motor is. Uh, it's just going to try to slow it down as quickly as possible. I should add that a lot of these motors, uh, these, you know, hobby brushless DC motors come in two flavors, censored and sensorless. And censored doesn't mean it talks like a sailor, it just means that they have Hall effect sensors in here so that the controller can know the position of the rotor at all times. And if it knows that, then it can apply the current to those three windings in such a way that it can always make the rotor spin uh, exactly in the way that it should to get the, to get a decent rotation. With a sensorless motor, 
if this rotor isn't spinning, there's no electricity coming out of these things. And with no Hall effect sensors, the controller has no idea where the rotor is. So the only thing it can do is just give it essentially a random pulse and then wait for a minute and see if the spinning rotor induces a voltage on the unused pin. And then it can figure out where the rotor is based on the voltages that it's creating just from its spin. So a lot of times you'll see uh, one of these motors start up, it'll actually go backwards for about a half turn, and then the controller realizes it started it in the wrong direction. But once it's moving, then it knows where the rotor is and it can speed up again. So the sensor sensor list motors are a bit more common and cheaper, and for applications where um, this is not connect, like you'd want a sensored motor if you were driving a bicycle or a vehicle, because the wheel is in contact with the ground, and it doesn't really have the ability to just kick it backwards for a half turn to see where the rotor is. So it kind of needs to have a good uh, way to accelerate from zero. For a quadcopter application, it's just connected to a propeller that's just sitting in air. So it doesn't really, it's, it's easy to get the motor started. In retrospect, I would probably try to go for a censored uh, application for this thing. But another um, challenge was getting a motor that doesn't spin too quickly. So these things are designed to be connected to small propellers and they spin very fast, you know. 10,000, 20,000 RPM even. Um, but I wanted to go slow, so when I was dispensing the fluid on here, you know, three or 400 RPM is fine. And uh, getting a motor that actually goes that slow is tricky. I thought I'd point out another bit of circuitry before we move on. This is kind of a weird little device. It's a potentiometer voltage divider, and the output of the voltage divider is connected to the gate of a pretty beefy NFET. And then the uh, source of the NFET is connected to ground, and the drain is connected to VCC, basically the 8-volt output of that power supply. And so since I mentioned I wanted this thing to be able to slow down if I commanded a lower RPM than it's currently spinning, it has to do something with all the energy that's currently in the rotor. And since it's continuing to commutate, it can't short out the motor windings because that would prevent the controller from seeing where the motor is. So what, what ends up happening, since it's basically a regenerative braking system, all of that power that's in the rotor, all the energy that's in that stored in that spinning rotor has to go back into the power supply. But that 8 volt switch mode power supply is not too happy about it. In fact, it's not able to um, sink much current at all. So there has to be some way of getting rid of that excess energy. So this, what this is, is basically a programmable Zener diode. So in normal operation, um, the NFET is not turned on at about seven or eight volts. But as the voltage rises, uh, it eventually turns the NFET on and starts conducting. It eventually looks like a short if the voltage gets high enough. So I don't know if that's really production quality. I don't know if I would put that in a real production circuit. In fact, I've never seen anything quite like that before. But it is very simple and it does work very well. I haven't tested it over temperature stability or anything, but let me know what you think about that. Part of the goal of this project was just to write a really tight PID control loop for this motor system so that I could command any RPM and get it to go to that speed very quickly. Even though it turned out for spin coders it's not uh, critical to have a really fast ramp rate. So I'm going to control this through the serial interface and just command it to go to 1000 RPM. So you can see it starts up and does just fine. You try 2000. It manages to reach the speed very quickly and um, comes to a standstill. So when I command a zero speed, then it's using full braking and it stops commutating. But if we go from say 2000 down to 1000, then that's essentially the regenerative braking thing where that uh, funny circuit is absorbing the power. Let's try that. So there's zero to 2000. And if we go to zero, or if we go to 1000, it's not quite as quick. And part of that is because um, the circuit is not really designed for regenerative braking, and so it's, it, it doesn't pull as much energy out of the system as, you know, as it could. But um, to go up to 4,000, it's not quite as snappy because uh, I've limited the total throttle setting just because I don't really need to go that fast. But it is kind of neat to see the thing uh, go to its extreme perform li performance limits. Okay, well let me know if you have any questions about that, and I will see you next time. Bye.